we started a company about 15 years ago called Ocean Grown. And what we do is we provide mineral uh, supplements to agriculture industry. And, uh, and about 10 years ago to animal nutritionists. And also we know from feedback from customers that um, they also use it for human nutrition. Although we, we can't recommend it because we'd be shut down pretty quick. FDA wouldn't like it too well. Um, and just to say, the way uh, Paul and I met, we just met for the first time this morning. We've talked on the phone once. Uh, Patty Foley uh, is our office manager, and she's been a raw food uh, addict for about 26 or 7 years. Hasn't cooked a thing. And just to get a sense of... You know the you know who I'm speaking to. How many are are 100% raw? 50%. 25. All right, all right. And anybody grow their own food? Okay, okay. Um, and in to somebody that's raw, if I could just ask a question. By the way, I'm going to leave plenty of time uh, toward the end for questions. And uh, is Paul in the room? No. Okay. Okay. I definitely will leave. Are you going to talk about it? Huh? Are you going to talk yeah, about Yeah, that's right. That's right. No, I just wanted to know. Uh, I, I will leave plenty of time for questions. I'm sure there will be some. And of the 100% raw people, who, what's the primary reason? I'm just curious why the primary reason. There was one hundred percent right? No? How about a 50 percenter? Yeah. Why, why do you eat raw? Oh. Okay, but it, any specific technical reason? <laughs> By the way, health, health is, I, I accept that answer. I mean, health is, a, is obviously a great reason. Minerals and vitamins and enzymes in the food. Okay, okay. Well, that's a great, that's a great entry point. And, um, uh, I don't know how much you know about agriculture or about growing food, but I, I just want to read you something, which is probably, and by the way, these things go all kind of wacky directions. I, I, don't, I don't do, a, I do a lot of presentations, but I don't do them from a script. It just depends who the audience is. And, and, but I want to read you this. We, we made a, this is something that hangs in every fertilizer distributor company building in the US. Ammonium nitrate alert. Do not sell ammonium nitrate to anyone who wants to pay in cash, does not want to give any personal information, address, phone number, etc. Does not want the product delivered but wants to haul it themselves, acts nervous during the purchase, is a new customer or is unknown to the local branch, and lastly, does not know anything about the turf and ornamental industry or fertilization in general. The reason they do this is because a nitrate bomb is what took the Edward R. Murrow building down. And if you look at all the other things that we use for fertilizing plants, it's nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Tremendously volatile compounds. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not putting it down because the, the father of modern agriculture was a guy named Justice von Liebig. And he lived back in the middle 1800s. And what he did is he did tissue tests. And he said, look, you do tissue tests of a leaf. And what you see is that leaves have nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And they're primary elements. They're there in large quantities. So he said, look, we have all these incendiary compound, we're between wars, we have all these stockpiles, let's go ahead and use that. So that's, that's how modern agriculture was born, N, P, and K. And, and if you look on the fertilizer bag, the three numbers you see, like 10, 10, 10, or 0, 6, 6, whatever it is, that's the percentage of available nitrogen, potassium, or phosphorus. And what's interesting is that it doesn't make good food. You know, it can make a lot of food, uh, but, but even the people that are farmers know that as, as the years go by, yields decline. And they're always fighting this problem. You know, they're putting back 
nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, but the yields continue to decline. So then you get Monsanto's of the world and, and other seed companies, they're into GMO because they're always looking for disease resistance and yield. And if you talk to farmers, and, and by the way, even organic farmers, you talk to organic farmers, at the end of the day, because it's a business and they're trying to survive, they actually, they can't care a lot about the quality of the food they make. It's pretty sad. I mean, literally, I've been on a lot of organic farms all over the country, and I said, don't you want to make better food? Not really interested. You know, their yields are good, their costs are good, off they go, they have a business. So believe it or not, not a lot of care. Oh, God, I forgot to take off my shoes. I'm an electrical engineer. That's the first thing. By the way, best floor ever to have in a house. Not, not just talk, concrete, even concrete. This is terrazzo, which is you know, a form of concrete. And it grounds you. And you know, it's, it's wonderful to be, that's, that's another thing. Uh, wonderful to be grounded. And uh, um, it, it's helping already. I can feel it. OK, I, I just wanted to read you a quote, too. And uh, it's interesting where it comes from. And then we'll get into the subject. I really don't know why it is that all of us are so committed to this sea, except I think it's because in addition to the fact that the sea changes and the light changes and ships change, it's because we all came from the sea. We won't get religious about this yet. And it is an interesting biological fact that all of us have in our veins the exact same percentage of salts in our blood that exist in the ocean. And therefore, we have salt in our blood, in our sweat, in our tears, if you ever wondered. We are tied to the ocean. And when we go back to the sea, whether it is to sail or to watch it, we are going back from whence we came. John F. Kennedy, Jr. <coughs> Sorry, John F. Kennedy, not Jr., the president. And if you don't know this, your, your <coughs> blood is almost identical to seawater in the sense of, uh, let's see, yeah, here it is. Everybody who took high school chemistry remembers this guy. This is all the natural elements in the universe and some of the man-made elements that occur other places like stars for microseconds or picoseconds or some short period of time. But if, if you look at human blood, human blood is, by the way, everybody thinks seawater is sodium chloride. You know, it tastes salty. But actually, most of the, 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 the middle of this chart are actually considered salts, earth salts, okay, not just sodium chloride. And if you look at the, and by the way, we're not going to get educational terribly, don't worry. But anyways, if you look at human blood, it has all these elements in this proportion, in this order, okay? Same as seawater, except seawater is sodium-based. Human blood is iron-based because it you know, have to, has to be able to carry oxygen. So now you look at chlorophyll, and chlorophyll, same order, same proportion, if the soil is good, okay? So a perfect soil, this is what chlorophyll in a plant has, except it's not sodium-based, it's not iron-based, it's magnesium-based. So, very interesting thing, and um, and I, I just before we get into the the, the science of this uh, and how important minerals are, remember minerals make up everything: sheetrock, paint, plastic, me, photographs, bottles, glass, silicon. It's silicon, okay. Everything is made up of, this is it. This is the blueprint to the universe in terms of building blocks. These are the building blocks of everything. That's how important they are. And um, the, the way I got into this briefly is that i uh, very interested in nutrition all my life. And, you know, went to health seminars and, and just like this. And there was a doctor, strangely enough, not far from here because at the time I was in New York City. Uh, lives up the road in Jensen Beach, and he talked about a fellow named Dr. Murray, who passed away in 1983, 
and lived in the, you know, went to school in the 30s. He was a double doctor, uh, internal medicine and uh, uh, ear, nose and throat doctor. And, um, and he researched, he, he had a kind of a mind that just was interested in everything. And when he was doing his residency at Massachusetts General, uh, he, you know, he'd get out at 12 o'clock at night. He'd work 12-hour shifts. He was stressed out. He was, you know, his mind was going a mile a minute. And he would just go out and walk in downtown Boston. And one time he came across a fisherman who had been fishing the Grand Banks off, way off the coast of, of New England. And he said, look, all day long I deal with sick people. I deal with hypertension, tumors, cancers, maladies of all kind. He said, what do fish get? And the fisherman didn't wait a second. He said, never seen a sick fish. I've been fishing 40 years, and in the open deep ocean, there's no such thing as a sick fish. And, you know, if you're a science guy or, you know, you have an inquiring mind, you're going to go, that's weird. Terrestrial, everything terrestrial is sick. Animals, freshwater fish, you cut open a freshwater fish, and you're going to find weird stuff. They all have something wrong with them. But if you go to the open ocean, nothing is sick. Everything is perfectly healthy. And he started to research it and he said, oh my God, seawater is not just sodium chloride. Seawater has all the periodic chart elements in it. In a certain proportion, fish are swimming in their pharmacopoeia. That's what they're in. And what, what governs their lifespan is no longer, you know, you know, everybody thinks we, you know, we, we're living a long time if we're living to be 90 or 80. You know, we're, we're designed to be 140. And in the old days, a lot longer. And so here you have the fish. What governs a fish's life? Well, now it's, it's, it's genetics govern its life, not its nutrition. So... Uh, Dr. Murray spent the rest of his life researching this. He, he had some very good friends in the Navy, and they would send him seawater samples back from all over the world. Uh, anybody heard of Wurlitzer Willitz, Willitz, organ? Back in the old skating days, the Wurlitzer organs? Well, the, the widow of the guy who invented that, and started that company was a patron of Dr. Murray. So she would fund his research and he did the most amazing research. And he would literally, there's a kind of a mouse named C3H mouse. And it was, it was, it was bred. It was hybridized to, to get cancer almost right away after birth. And what he would do, and, oh, and by the way, and die in a few months. You know, that had a, it, was a, it was developed as a tool to do research, this mouse. So he fed them food that was grown with minerals from the ocean. And what he found out is that, yes, a few died, but out of the whole population, most survived, most were cured, and, most he, and then he had to sacrifice them because they literally became, um, what's the word? Well, for their kind of mouse, uh, immortal. From their genetic, they actually became, you know, the genetics got fixed and for their purposes became immortal. So he continued this research for a long, long time until his death. And uh, he, he eventually had a little test farm over in Fort Myers. And he ended up, he ended his life running a, a Florida had a few uh, strange, uh, uh, institutes, and one was called the Sunland Institute down in Fort Myers that housed children that were uh, mentally impaired or physically impaired. In the old days, that's what they did. They put them in a place. And this was actually only in the 70s and 80s. They did a lot of research with uh, uh, medicines and things like that to try to help them. But uh, at the end of the day, they had no help. Okay, so that's Dr. Murray. And how I got into this, again, the health seminar, I heard about Dr. Murray. And, and the first, you know, I'm an engineer. So like, I want to know how things work. And it just, when the presenter who had met Dr. Murray, uh, you know, told me about it, I said, 
you know, is there anybody I can talk to about how to do this because I know this is the right thing. I knew a little bit about chemistry at the time and I knew that how it worked and electrically how it worked. And uh, so I went down to meet his last living disciple, if you will. And uh, he lived also in Fort Myers. And I came down, I flew down because I lived in Connecticut at the time. I flew down and met with him. And literally, we stayed up all night. I mean, we stayed up all night talking about things, talking about food. He was a, a raw food eater uh, and, and very much into wheatgrass, which we'll get into in a minute. And I saw you got a, a nice batch out the back, really nice batch. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so we talked all night and I said, look, you know, I, I knew how agriculture was done. And I said, you know, you, you need to resurrect this. You have all the knowledge that Dr. Murray had. And here you are, you're retired, you're living in a trailer next to your daughter's house. This is going to go with you when you die. And he actually, he died December 13th or 14th, a uh, couple months ago. And so I said, you know, we got to resurrect this. We got to, there, there has to be a way to do this. And so, but the first thing I did when I got back home is I said, okay, if this is true, I'm not just going to believe it, you know, but if it's true, then there, you know, it's kind of a Missouri mentality, show me. And uh, I picked wheatgrass. I said, look, the most potent food I know of is wheatgrass. And the proof of it is that, you know, how do you get a 2,500 pound buffalo, perfectly healthy, no osteoporosis, no cancer, no illnesses of any kind, and it eats one thing, grass. Okay? That, to me, that's just stunning. You know, here we are, we got to eat a little of this, a little of that, a little of this, a little of that. You know, our whole lives is, you know, spent grocery shopping and all this kind of thing. And here you got buffalo that eat one thing, grass. And what is special about grass? Most grasses. The list on the right, and, and for that matter, the left, but the list on the right is 90 elements. And grasses are the only crop that pick up all 90. So... You know, if you, if you pick up a tomato, a perfect tomato, which is what we grow for ourselves at home, 56 elements. Corn, if you want to eat corn, 72 elements. Sweet potato, 76. Uh, and so on. They have a genetic permission, plants do, to do certain things if you feed them right. And what I mean by certain things is that they, they produce certain compounds, to your point, enzymes, which can easily be damaged. That's why people like to eat raw because every food you have comes with the enzymes to digest it. They travel together. Even if you're eating meat, there are enzymes. If you eat it raw, not a great idea today, but if you do, enzymes to digest that meat are in the meat until you cook it above a certain temperature. So if you, if you like black and blue steak, then you're in better shape because I'm, I'm pretty well certain the enzymes survive. Um, so, and there's a temperature at which they're destroyed. Uh, and there's some debate about that, but it's generally around 118 degrees. Uh, some, some survive longer and some don't. But, and uh, that research was done by a guy named Dr. Kuchikov. And it, it's very interesting research, but he noticed that the body the body, uh, the white cell, and I'll get back to the story eventually, but the white blood cell count goes through the roof when you eat cooked food because your body thinks it's an invader and it tries to do everything it can to, to remedy the situation, if you will. And you can, you can do a study. You say, okay, I'm going to eat this and nothing bad, you know, your white blood cells don't do anything. Then you cook it and things happen. So, okay, so I picked wheatgrass juice coming back to the, the storyline. And what I would do is I'd grow my own wheatgrass with the best I could do to, to mimic seawater minerals. And I, I had no expectation. I was just, okay, you know, it, let's, let's see what happens. And my stepson hates it when I tell this story because he doesn't get the point of the story, but I know you will. Uh, and he works for us, so, but he's, he's a good kid. He's 26. Anyways, um, 
So I said, okay, look, I'm going to grow wheatgrass. I'm going to juice it. I'm going to drink 10 ounces a day because I'm in a hurry. And what I would do, because personally, I don't like the taste. I don't like the smell. I don't like anything about wheatgrass juice except the result. So I took my 10 ounce tumbler. I chug it. And I literally, I wouldn't take a breath. I wouldn't take a breath after I was done. I would immediately drink something else just to get rid of the taste. I, I, I just don't like it. I'm, I'm not one of those people. Everybody else in the office likes it. it and our, by the way, in defense of our wheatgrass, it's the best I've ever tasted. It's so sweet. It's so sweet. And we're going we're gonna to talk about complex sugars and carbohydrates and sweetness and everything later, but it's very sweet. Uh, so if you don't like the taste of wheatgrass because it tastes bitter or something else, then I have an answer for you. Okay, so the death by wheatgrass diet, which is what I call it. Uh, 10 ounces a day, chug it. And again, I had no expectations. I thought I was perfectly healthy. In fact, I, I even like thought I was really healthy. Okay, so what happened next is that my wife started coming, my office at the time, I lived in New Orleans, was on the ground floor, and uh, she would come downstairs and, by the way, addicted to coffee, still, love coffee, I love the effect, I actually like the taste, and by the way, it has a lot of minerals in it, okay, because that's what I'm after is minerals, so anyways, so I, I, I drank my coffee, uh, about 10 o'clock I chugged the wheatgrass juice, and then about two or three in the afternoon, my wife would come down to my office and say, hey, Philip, you haven't eaten anything. What can I make for you? I, said, I can't eat a thing. I'm stuffed. You know how you feel after Thanksgiving, if you can remember back to when you had a Thanksgiving or whatever? You know that, that feeling of just stuffed and tired? And Well, I felt stuffed. I didn't feel tired. I feel super energetic uh, to the point of not needing a lot of sleep, uh, a lot of energy. And um, so, again, about three months in, she's coming down saying, you got to eat something. I said, I can't eat. I feel stuck. And, um, and I'll talk about why that is, that you don't feel like eating uh, that way. But what happened is, about four months in, um, my, I, by the way, I forgot a bit to the story, which is when, when I was young, my dad was in the Foreign Service, and we lived in Vietnam. And I picked, this is in the middle 50s, and I picked up a, don't know what it was, but all my fingernails and toenails fell out. And sheets of skin, for some reason, from elbow down to the hands, would peel off, kind of like a Bruegel painting, if you have the reference, you know, where they're peeling people alive. And, uh, and they put me on very high doses of antibiotics at the time. And, and back in the 50s, antibiotics were not real good for lots of parts of your body, including your liver. Mine survived. And, um, but the fingernails kind of stayed on, but they weren't very good and didn't have toenails. So fast forward 40 years, and my wife comes down. Now we're about four months into the death by wheatgrass diet. And she said, uh, you're getting toenails. And I'm going, wow, that's, that's neat. So... The end of the story is that at the last family reunion, I was voted best toenails of my generation. Uh, and Not toenail model quality, not a model uh, for toenails, but uh, they're there and they're, they're really nice. And the other thing is I lost 20 pounds without a hunger pain. So, you know, when you're in a grocery store and you see somebody going down the, the produce aisle and they're four or 500 pounds, what you're seeing is really somebody starving to death, okay? That's what you're looking at because they translate the urge, the hunger urge, for mass. You know, they're, they're looking for mass food is what they're looking for. And what they're not getting is nutrition. What they're not getting is minerals because if you get them, you, you'll never have another hunger pain. I mean, it's, it's just stunning. So, okay, so death by wheatgrass, I come back to the Don Jansen, who's the person I met down in Florida when I heard about Dr. Murray. And I said, look, you gotta, we got to salvage this because this is the answer to food shortages. I mean, think about it. 
if, any, if everybody in the world needed 10 ounces of wheatgrass, by the way, I'm not promoting this in any way. I'm not recommending it. But if you, if you take something down to its most pure level, you know, how easy would it be to get everybody in the world 10 ounces of wheatgrass juice? They could grow it themselves. Every village could do it. I mean, it, it would be the end of hunger on earth. There's no reason. There's no reason. You know, the, the whole meat supply, and I'm not, I eat meat. I'm not railing against the meat, but it's the least efficient form of eating, you know, in terms of water, in terms of chemical, in terms of diesel fuel, in terms of everything you can think of. So um, we got into it, and, and what we did is we said, okay, look, is there machinery? that we can make, because that's my background, is machine design and electrical engineering, is can we actually make something that's cost effective for a farmer to use? And we, we developed some prototype machineries, which we now have many of, and we got into business. And in the, in the first year, in fact, I think somewhere here, mm, the other way, yeah, there it is. This is out in South Dakota, that little strip there. That's our first trial strip with a farmer in South Dakota who grew wheat and corn. And, and right away, and we were, at that time, we were trying to duplicate Dr. Murray's studies. And we just knocked it out of the park. The, the plants were healthier. They didn't get fungus, which is very common in wheat in the Midwest and higher yields and so it's a it's about minerals and 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 by the way when i give talks to farmers uh we start in a little bit of a different way and i say you know what's your core business if you look at it from a business standpoint what are you actually doing as a farmer and you know one guy holds his hand up and he said, well, you know, I, gray, I, get, I raise uh, field corn for animals, animal feed, you know, for dairy feed. Another guy would say, I grow alfalfa. And again, that's primarily used in dairy and, and sometimes equine fields. And uh, another farmer would stand up and say, you know, I raise corn and we use it for ethanol. You know, it goes to an ethanol plant and, and so on and so forth. And this goes on for a while. And I said, that's not your core business. Your core business is that you're a strip miner. And what you're doing is you're planting seeds instead of dynamite. And those seeds are breaking apart the matrix of the soil, the soil matrix, and liberating the minerals so that they become plant available. The plant picks them up. And, you know, generally speaking, uh, let's take, and eh, we'll take wheat. Wheat's a good example. 20 ton. 15 ton of wheat will come off an acre of land. Okay, so every year you're taking 30,000 pounds off an acre of land. Every year, year after year, year after year, 100 years. Okay, and all they're putting back to grow it is 300 pounds. Anybody into mathematics? You see what's happening. I mean, things are leaving. <laughs> Nothing's coming back. It's a mining operation, okay, except they're mining minerals. And in the case of wheat, I mean, most, most of the commodity crops, even corn, are types of grasses, okay? So here you are. You're, you're strip mining out of the soil, 90 minerals, hundreds, you know, we're 100 years. Actually, we're not even 100 years. If, if you look on the Internet, there's a guy named uh, Dr. Northen and Rex Beach, and they did a, a testimonial to Congress that said in the 1930s that our soils were mined out. They were wrecked. And, you know, we've kind of resurrected it with sort of toxic chemicals. Um, but, you know, it's not good food. We're not making good food. And again, you know, I just want to touch on organics, and I know you're going to like this, maybe. But organics is is... It's, it's wonderful that they're trying to get rid of synthetic chemistry and synth synthetic chemicals, but the whole thing is corrupt. And what I mean by that is that, you know, they don't even understand 
really how the, the, the agronomy works. I mean, technically, the government doesn't actually know how the thing works. So, you know, here we are. I, I did a tour of an organic farm in California that was growing corn. And uh, I'm walking down the aisle, you know, down the row uh, with the owner of the farm. And coming the other way is a guy in a hazmat suit with a backpack sprayer. And I said to the owner, I said, this is an organic farm. <laughs> he had a respirator on. He had a full face mask. He had gloves, the suit. And he said, well, you know, the National Organic Program allows you to, to spray this chemical if you stay away from the stalk by 12 inches. And I'm going, does he know how far that root structure goes? You know, somebody in Washington said, hey, that's safe enough without really, you know, the root structure, long way. Anyway, okay. In fact, I have pictures of roots here somewhere, but it goes a long way. So organic farm, what they do is, you know, they take manures and they spread those and they, you know, they use bacteria. It's a wonderful thing. Well, we're going to talk about bacteria in a minute. Uh, you know, worm casings. Uh, you know, they use, they make teas, certain kinds of teas as, as fertilizer. But at the end of the day, these are the building blocks of the universe. And unless you can put those back, you're going to have a declining crop year over year. You, manure is not going to do it because think about it. That manure is only as good as what the cow was grazing on. And if the cow was grazing on a field that had been mined out since the 1930s, that manure is not, it's virtual, you know? So, and, and, and here's an interesting thing. You know, there's, there's, we have a customer we're working on now called uh, Village Farms. I don't know if you've ever, you've ever seen their, if you go down the produce aisle, they're generally the ones in the plastic clamshell boxes. They, they look perfect, beautiful. It's the most beautiful tomato I've ever seen, except it tastes like cardboard. They're hydroponically grown. And if you know anything about, does anybody grow hydroponically? A little bit? We, we, we do uh, our, our Certain vegetables we, we sprout, uh -huh. braids, with those mats. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the deal with hydroponics is that even the most sophisticated of which, and, and by the way, it all comes from Holland. It's all Dutch technology, both the machinery and the, and the nutrients. And they literally have 11 elements, macro elements. And that's it. And here, remember I said tomatoes, 56 elements to be genetically fulfilled, 56 elements. And here we're giving it 11. Of course, it's going to taste like cardboard. The, the cons you know, tomatoes have a very distinctive uh, feel to them when you eat them, you know, in terms of what they, you know, they're not, they shouldn't be all mushy. And um, so we're working with them and they're not particularly interested, you know, they, the only thing that interests them is how much does it cost and will I get the same yield? And we can do that. You know, we're, we, we can do, we can meet those criteria and we're less expensive. Um, but, you know, because it deviates from the norm, like the, the Dutch haven't approved it as a, as a form of fertility for hydroponics, then it's a very difficult road for us. I, you know, with some companies we've been, uh, we, we've been trialing for five years. Uh, you know, a young startup company, how do you survive five years of trials and still stay in business? And we're still here 15 years later. Um, I'm going to stop for questions in a minute or two. And, um, but I, I just want to say that uh, this, this also works with animals. And, you know, we, we have four dogs. We use it on our dogs. Uh, if you have horses, it works phenomenally well for horses. We have actually one of our, our most devoted and, and oldest customers is in Loxahatchee, not too far away. And she rescues polo ponies. And what they do is, you know, when they get lame, you know, the, the billionaires kind of throw away the polo ponies. And she goes and gets them and nurses them back to health. 
And when the, the former owners see them, I mean, they're beautiful. Coats are shiny, hooves are perfect, uh, lively, healthy, and they try to buy them back for large amounts of money because they're, they're, they're really expensive polo ponies. And you need three, you need three polo ponies for every, every you know, you change, very expensive sport anyway. So uh, it's used on chickens, egg laying chickens, uh, broiler chickens, uh, goats. Uh, we, we just got a call the other day from one of our distributors in Michigan and he was saying, you know, this is his first full year of having the goats on it. And he said, our, our, normally he loses 50 goats, baby goats a year. Just to, that's the mortality rate because of the winters and pneumonia and other things. This year only three. Okay. So it, it, when you rest, and it makes sense. Come on. Look, building blocks of the universe. If you don't get them, how can you be healthy? Uh, if you don't get them in the right proportionality, that's another thing because, you know, you need arsenic to be healthy. Do you trust the guy down at the fertilizer company with his shovel to put the right amount of arsenic in your fertilizer? I'm not going to do it. So um, it, it's a very, and the last thing I'm going to say, uh, and then I'll, I'll stop for questions. Um, one of our advisory board members is a guy named Dr. Richard Ulrey. And fascinating guy. He, he's very much interested in DNA and RNA uh, replication. And remember, we're, we, we kind of started on genetics, which is where, you know, you know, if you're perfectly healthy, then, you know, a lot of your health issues are in your genetic. You know, you look at, that's why doctors do an intake thing. They say, you know, were your parents healthy? What did they have? You know, what did they die from? That kind of thing. And so, but to fulfill your genetic, Minerals are the key. And, uh, but the last thing I'm going to say is the way DNA replicates itself, it unwinds. You know, everybody's seen those pictures of DNA, half the strand coming apart and replicating itself. Well, there is a terminator mineral that completes the transaction, if you will, as it replicates itself. And there's four of them. And... Uh, Magnesium, selenium, iodine, and boron. And if you're missing it in an available form, then the, the replication doesn't happen correctly. It truncates. It, 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 it's like a train, you know, somebody decoupling a train and half of it going away. That's what you end up with. So in healthy people, and this, this shocked me when I heard it, in healthy people, there are 250,000 replications that don't happen every day in a healthy person. Okay. So very deep minerals are the key. And uh, I'll leave you with a, a fun fact about uh, eggs and sperm that the uh, it, it's selenium is the lead. It's the lead mineral in every cell in sperm and the egg can detect which is the healthiest sperm. I'm not saying it's a healthy one, it's the healthiest of the lot, and the egg picks it. So I'll leave it at that and uh, open up the question.